Okay, we're live. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to TWIG. TWIG stands for This Week in Global Health. TWIG is a live weekly broadcast in which we give you a roundup of all the news, the, the happenings, the good, the bad, the ugly in the global health space. This week, we're going to be talking about how to apply for and how to interview for a job in the global health space. If you're watching live, please feel free to tweet us at, at TWIGH, that's TWIG. Um, or, of course, you can send a message to us straight through the webpage. Some people might be watching this on our webpage, which is www.twig.org, T-W-I-G-H.org. Um, on the subject of finding a job or looking for work or careers in global health, we've got a number of other episodes and other videos that we've put together. So go to our webpage, have a look around. Uh, I'm sure there'll be stuff that you're interested in. Right, we're going to jump right in, and I'm going to ask each of the panel members to introduce themselves. I'll start with myself. My name is Greg Martin. I'm going to be talking about how to prepare for an interview. Next up, Terry. Hi, everybody. This is Terry Schmidt out in Southern California. I have to tell you that for the Los Angeles Marathon on Saturday, 90 degrees, and for the rest of the world, 32 degrees Celsius. Good to see you, everybody. Nice, 90 degrees. Delicious. Okay, next up, Chris. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Chris Ronson. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, California. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, how to begin looking for a job, not only where, but the how, I think, is the big part, and how to figure out where you fit in in global health. Thanks very much, Chris. And over to Katie. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Jackson. I'm coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. Um, I'm going to be highlighting a few of these positions uh, all around the world so that you can get your first job in global health, or your second or third. Thanks very much, Katie. Now, we usually have, and we always have, a quick news roundup, what's happening in the global health space right now. And for that, I'm going to ask Chris. Chris, will you jump in and quickly give us a news roundup? Okay, yes, I can. Good. All right. Oh, sorry. Took me a minute. Uh, so today's global health, or today's news comes to you from Global Health News Now. Again, we don't have Brian Simpson with us this week, so I'm going to be just giving you two quick stories about things that are current in the global health space. The first one deals with Colombia. Um, there is an outbreak of chikungunya in Colombia. They've reported 175,000 cases of the disease. Uh, now, how has the epidemic affected the country at this scale? Uh, the city paper in Bogota lists the different ways. A couple of the examples they've given are that the hospitals in the nation's six largest cities uh, recently ran out of beds for patients, so they're completely at capacity. Uh, the, there are online videos of Colombians singing about their chikungunya, and that's actually attracted millions of views, so you could say the virus has gone viral. I regret that immediately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> President Juan Manuel Santos uh, announced in early January that Colombia's armed forces would actually be playing an active role in distributing pain relievers to people suffering from chikungunya. So, despite recent successes against uh, chikungunya in different hot spots in the city, the government anticipates there being uh, a total of about 670,000 people that are going to be affected by the end of this year. So this is definitely something to keep your eyes posted about uh, over the course of the year in the global health space. Secondly, just another to, quick to update. Your Last your week, eyes posted about? <laughs> huh? To keep your eyes posted about? To keep your eyes, yeah, to wait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on. I'm doing great today, aren't I? You're doing uh, great. So. <laughs> uh, another issue that we're going to talk about really quickly is the Ebola response. Now, something that we covered last week was uh, different aspects of the Ebola response, how we've seen it sort of unfold in the last year, and we definitely weren't shy about talking about the WHO roles in this response. Uh, the WHO has actually commissioned an independent panel to review all aspects of its Ebola response, uh, or its response to the outbreak, in keeping with the resolution that they passed during the Ebola special session back in January 2015. And there's going to be a lot of uh, really amazing professionals that are going to be a part of that panel, including Alona Kickbush, we've got Julio Frank, Dame Barbara Stocking, and a number of other extremely qualified individuals individuals who are going to be sort of figuring out where things went wrong uh, and how to do better in the future. Hopefully not the same situation and not even a comparable situation, but just how we can adapt our responses to global health emergencies. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. And thanks for the new instruction to keep our eyes posted about something. Um, you got to get if creative. <laughs> if anyone's confused about how to do that, get in touch with Chris at on Twitter with at Chris Ronson, and she will give you advice about keeping your eyes posted about something. Next up, we've I got will. Terry. Terry's going to talk about um, how employers approach hiring. So if, you, if you're looking for a job, this is, this is uh, some advice from someone who's certainly a, a, a seasoned uh, player in the global health space. Terry, over to you. Well, 
Greg, for sure, we need to keep our eyes on what the employer is looking for. All of, when we're looking for a job, what we want is a job. That's not what the employer wants. The employer wants a candidate that fits their culture, fits their operation, fits their needs. And that's what you have to fit into. One of the skills you can develop for yourself to get there is creating a mission, vision, and value statement. The mission part is why you're here on Earth. The mission part, or the, uh, the vision part, is where you're going in this journey. And we're going to all live those value or those missions and visions by values. Doing this is so important because you need a match with your employer. I, I couldn't agree with you. Value, there's a match yeah. with your employer. If you don't match, you've got an unmatch, you're not going to last in that job. And so, with that in mind, I need to also add that, Greg, uh, that most people aren't aware. 50% of the employers, when they're looking for the fill position, never post it. In some cases, they may legally be required to because they're a publicly funded agency or a government entity. Most go by knowing who you know. So someone who knew someone knew someone. So the networking is what you need to work. Your degree is one half of the job. Networking is the other half of the job. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Terry, on both points. The first is mm -hmm. you need to have a strong value statement, a mission, a vision, a value that you can present to the employer. That's what they're looking for, someone who fits with their, their, their organizational culture. And the second point is, of course, you've got a network. You've got a network like crazy. Uh, most jobs, or at least half of the jobs that are out there, are not posted online or anywhere, and it's all a matter of who knows who. Uh, Chris, Chris, you're going to talk to us a little bit about the process of looking for a job, um, how, like yes. taking that search. Uh, so I, that's exactly right. I'm going to be talking to everybody a little bit about how to begin looking for a job, how to figure out what type of area of global health you'd like to go into, as well as a couple of pointers on expanding your network. Um, now, when you're looking for a job, it's important to think critically about your skill set. So what can you offer potential employers, much as Terry said? What is your personality, your motivations? How can you best leverage as your skill set for both this job and within the discipline of global, uh, global health? As Terry said, 50% of jobs are never found on the internet. What this means for all of us out there on the job hunt is that we have to get creative and we have to get resourceful. Now, I personally struggled for a long time figuring out what area of global health I wanted to go into. One of the best things that I did was gain exposure. There are courses on Coursera, on Coursera or on edX. Um, you can attend different webinars to sort of figure out more about the different disciplines. If you live near a university, be it a community college or a university with an amazing global health program, there's always events and opportunities to go talk to professors, um, email people, set up Skype meetings. A lot of people out there in the industry right now are excited about this new uh, wave of global health professionals and students. And a lot of them, if they have the time, would love to get in touch with you and offer you a little bit of advice. Yeah, I would I would second that. I would say that it's never never be afraid to email someone or reach out to someone because you would actually, I think, and it surprises me that you'd be surprised how many people would answer and how many people are happy to chat with you, happy to have coffee, happy to have a Skype. And I always, uh, you know, figure out their, their email. You can Google everything and just send them an email. And the first thing you have to say is why you're emailing them. So I find this, your name, and I want to talk to you because of this reason. Engage them. Why is it that you have sought out their email and written something? Yeah. Uh, but don't, don't be afraid and engage the conversation and, and and appeal to what they are they are um, experts in because yeah. obviously you pick them up for a reason. But I really would encourage you. Emails are so easy to write. You write a million a day. Why not do one? And if you are writing to um, an academic or to somebody who's working for a certain company, make sure that you are familiar with what it is that they've done. So cite some research that appealed to you. Let them know that you've engaged and that you've done some research and that you are worth 10, 15 minutes, a half an hour of their time uh, and their mentorship and their advice. So it's definitely worthwhile. And like Katie said, there's absolutely nothing to lose. You know what I lose. would suggest, Chris? And I, just, to, just to follow on with what everyone's saying here, networking is mm -hmm. important. But... Don't engage in the networking working process only at the point in time that you're looking for a job or looking for a career move. Yes. Networking is something you've just got to be doing all and of the time. That is, oh, sorry. No, no, carry on, Chris. Okay. I'm oh, sure I was going to say, that's an important point. Uh, oh. 
<laughs> that's a very important point that you make. There's, depending on where you live, and there's probably one everywhere, if there isn't an online community of people that you can interact with, there should be a physical community of people. Like take Boston, for example. There's an organization or a group called BNID, the Boston Network for International Development. And what they do is basically serve as a point of connection for groups and individuals in the Boston area who are looking into global health issues or international development. And what you'll find there is a group of like-minded people of different generations and of different professional levels from you know your own generation and your peers to people older or younger than you that you can A, learn things from, um, and B, maybe even get a little bit of professional development, volunteer opportunities, experiences along those lines. Finding events, finding groups is going to be essential to you sort of uh, getting embedded and engaging in the global health world, but don't wait until you need a job. It's something and that if there isn't you a group, start one, right? So if you mm -hmm. live in an area and there's no group for, that meet that are interested in global, start a group. Start like the, the you know the I when I lived in London, I started the London Global Health Network. It was just and we used to get together and have a beer, um, and uh, it was just a group <laughs> yeah. of people interested in global health. So uh, yeah. the other thing that I wanted to say about networking is this. If there's someone that's of quite a high profile person and you want to get in touch with them, two things. Do not send them a long, lengthy, three page long email, right? They're not going to read it. Send them something short and punchy. And in the email, don't be asking for a job. Just send them a short, punchy email. And I think what I find, if I want to get a response from someone, in that short, punchy email, include a question, right? It gives them something to respond to. And you might want to ask for advice or, you know, you could say to them, hey, I've, I read a paper that you wrote, I was really interested, and I was wondering, bada bing, bada boom. And, you know, most people will respond to that kind of email. And then you've got a dialogue, you've got a, net, a person that's in an organization that you're interested in. At some point in the future when you, there's a job opportunity in that organization, you can re-reach out to that person and say, hi, I don't know if you remember me, we were in email contact a little while ago. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about a post that's available at the moment and whether or not I'd be a good fit or you may have a question. And that's, so that's what I do. You know, it's not necessarily a, a, you know, a, a fail-safe method, but that's, I found that quite a useful system. Yeah, yeah there's would, definitely yeah, actually, an etiquette to this. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I would say that um, we're doing really well today. Go ahead, Terry. <laughs> so I just want to mention, um, as, as, you, as we're looking for jobs, what the employers are looking for. And there are four things we know that they want to see, and they're probably not what you're telling them. They want to know you have the ability to learn and problem solve. You need to tell them that in your resume, in your CV. They want to know you have the ability to write. They want to know if you have the ability to speak and present. So again, put those go into your resume, your CV, saying, I presented this many times. I've this regularly presenting. They write regularly this this way. And lastly, I want to know if you can work in a small group. If you cannot work in a small group, you're not going to be a fit. So there are those four things in mind. I just have to add one more thing. If you're applying for five jobs, you need to have five different CVs and resumes. You gotta look different. How do they look? You need to look like what you're applying for. Bear in mind these employers run all the resumes they receive, which are now in hundreds now, they're now thousands, through a computer program that searches for keywords. The keywords are what they listed they're looking for. It needs to be in your CV, in your resume. Okay, I couldn't agree more. Now, let's just talk about some practical stuff, right? You've applied for a job. You've gotten a response from the organization, right? They've contacted you and said, we like you. You're one of the candidates. Please come for an interview. Now, do not just pitch up to an interview without preparing for that interview. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it is that you need to do when preparing for a job interview in the global health space. The first thing is you need to know everything there is to know about the organization that you're applying for. Because if something comes up in the interview, if a question gets asked or it, if it becomes apparent that you don't really know what it is that they're about, what their values are, what it is that they're trying to do, how it is that they work, you're going to look silly. The second thing is, and this might sound obvious, but people often drop the ball here, you have to know everything you can about the job itself, right? So in the job advert, there'll be the terms of reference of the job, and in that, they'll describe what it is they're looking for, what it is that the role will include, what competencies they're looking for, what kind of experience they're looking for. You have to read that page a hundred times until you could say it backwards. It needs to be second nature to you. And if you do, you're going to know how it is to prepare for the interview. Uh, in, you know, you're going to know what questions to start practicing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. The next thing you need to do is you need to think through what questions may come up in the interview itself. 
um, and then you need to practice those questions. So it's it's no it's no good uh, just sort of listing a, 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 making a list of questions and sort of thinking, okay, I sort of more or less have an answer to these questions. You need to have gone through them in detail. Uh, and you might, in the, while, you, while you're listening to this, you might be thinking, oh my god, what, I don't have any in my mind. I'm quickly going to run through a couple of examples of questions that you might want to just prepare for for any given interview. The first is, in any given interview, do not assume that they've read your CV. That they may well have, but they might not have. They may have so many candidates, they may have glanced at your CV briefly, but they may not know. So they may say to you, please walk us through your career, walk us through your CV and have that polished. Be able to give them a synopsis of your career in about 45 seconds. Don't waffle because you don't want to take up too much of your interview time. And in that discussion about your CV, try to match up your experience. Oh, sorry, I just need to try to match up your experience with the competencies and the experience that, that, that the terms of reference of the job ask for. So that's the one thing. The next question that they're likely to ask is, why are you interested in this role? Have a nice, tight, prepared answer for that. They might ask you, why do you think you're a good candidate for this role? Have a nice, tight, prepared answer for that. They might ask you, and they will ask you for examples of where it is that you've worked and what work you've done that matches up with the competencies that they're looking for. So again, look at the terms of reference in, in uh, you know, of, of the job, the job description, and make sure that for every single competency that they ask for that you can cite an example of you having done that or you having demonstrated that competency in your professional life before now. They're going to bring it up. These are the questions that they're going to ask. You've got to be ready for them. Um, the other thing is this. Practice, the, practice these answers with someone. Get, get a friend of yours to sit with you and do it again and again and again until it's easy for you to, to give nice, tight answers for them. Other questions that may come up is, um, give us an example of when you dealt with conflict in a workplace. Give us an example of when it is that you worked on a team or with a difficult person. Uh, tell us about your greatest achievements. Tell us about when it is that you might have failed. Tell us about your strengths or weaknesses. All of these things come up. Um, and you've got to have nicely prepared tight answers for them. And the final point, uh, piece of advice I want to give you is this. At the end of an interview, they very often say, they almost always say to you, do you have any questions or do, would you like to make a statement? And it's quite important at that point to have something nice and prepared that you can give out. Um, even if they say, do you have any questions and you don't have a question, it, I think it's quite fine at that point to say, look, I don't have a question but I'd like to make a statement. And then just have something nice and tight that you can say. And um, you know, that, so that's my advice on preparing for an interview. Make sure you spend time preparing. Don't do it the day before. Spend at least at least a week before uh, going through these things again and again and again. Um, we we kind of running out of time, so we're going to jump straight into Katie's careers corner. Katie's going to tell you a little bit about uh, some job opportunities and some resources that are out there that you might find useful. Uh, Katie, over to you. Good, awesome. So uh, I'm excited to keep going with this segment of Katie's Career Corner, and I'm actually thrilled to have a whole episode on careers. Um, but the ones that I've, I've pulled a few uh, jobs just from uh, different locations today, but I am going to start off with something. There's an interesting article from The Muse that we'll put on our website and in our show notes about how to ask for a job without asking for a job. And I think it's a really great article because as I was reflecting about as we were talking here, I don't think I've ever asked for a job when I've gone to meet people. And I think it's a really good idea just to be really annoying and by their side the whole time and then you as they like are going through problems you just like keep talking with them having coffee and then suddenly oh yeah you realize you're the perfect candidate um, so give that a read um, also there is a EU public affairs slash healthcare internship at Weber Shandwick um, Weber Shandwick is a leading public health uh, public relations sorry leading global public relations and marketing agency with offices in 81 countries. And the European Public Affairs Practice in Brussels is looking for a proactive and outgoing inter, uh, intern with experience of working in uh, European policy. First class English language skills are required and interest in developing consultancy skills to join this team. Uh, second job on the list today is a program officer, Data for Health Initiative uh, at, with the Union in Asia Pacific region. The Union is seeking qualified candidates for the position of program officer, Data for Health Initiative. Uh, applicants must possess a valid work permit to work in Singapore. Uh, other um, re requirements are that you have a master's degree, a uh, good level of English, etc. That will also be on our website. 
Uh, we have a few from Partners in Health, our good friends at Partners in Health. Uh, one position is a foundations officer. The foundation officer serves as an integral member of the growing foundation relations team at PIH and will uh, be directly responsible for increasing revenue for organizational priorities in a dynamic and fast-paced environment. You can check for the uh, job uh, application on our website. Second uh, Partners in Health job, Grants Manager. A Grants Manager serves as the primary point person for the post-award management uh, of at least one large-scale government grant. Working together with the Director of Grants Implementation, this person will proactively lead management of the grant and ensure overall strategic focus, management effectiveness, financial probity and compliance to all grant-funded program activities. So if this sounds like you, the job will be hosted on our website. Okay. Um, cool. We have a few more, oh, but sorry. we're going go to end here and then go on. Well, what but we, we also will have a bunch in the show notes. Yes. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to have uh, all of the links to all of those jobs in our show notes and on our webpage. So if you go to our webpage, twig.org, T-W-I-G-H.org, we've got a, a section there called Careers Corner. Go there, you're going to find links to everything that we've talked about. Um, we, we're not going we're going to end the show now. If you're watching live, don't go away because actually the live show carries on. We're going to have some discussion. We're going to respond to questions that might have come over Twitter or may have come from the webpage. But if you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening to the podcast, this will be the end of the show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We're going to be back same time, same place next week. As always, don't do drugs. Always do your best. Don't ever change. And we will see you next week. Take care. Oh, quick side note for those watching in the U.S. Uh, learned this the hard way. Daylight savings time. We moved an hour forward, but everybody else stayed in the same place. So if you didn't figure out the time change this time around, Remember for next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Should I do? The, should, I, should, should I say goodbye again? Okay. So thank you for watching. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Always do your best. Don't ever change, etc., etc. So on and so forth. Bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> See you next week. Cheers. <laughs>